Okay, today's daf is Kufyud. We are 11 lines down from the top of Kufyud Amul Aleph. We just talked about snake bites. Now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, other uh, remedies related to snakes. The issue being here, various uh, recommended remedies for different problems that the rabbis uh, suggested. So we have Hayman de Karche If a snake wraps itself around you, then linchot lemaya, you should go into the water. Velischof di kula arisha, and you should take a basket and turn it over on its head. Ulehad kemine, and put it in between you and the snake, so that the snake climbs onto the basket. Vechisalik ilave, and when the snake moves onto the basket, lishade lemaya, you should throw it into the water. Velislok. And then you should get out of the water. Okay, in other words, it's, te- it's telling you to coax the snake onto this basket, basically, and then get out of the water. That's not as much of a medical remedy as a matter of safety, uh, that if a person has, is attacked by a snake, it's a good thing not to try to fight the snake directly, because then it's going to just bite you, but rather to try to convince it to move onto a different surface that, that you can then throw into the water and remove yourself from the situation as fast as possible. Hi, man de mikne bechivya. A person who a snake gets angry at. So you have an issue. A snake has, has an issue with you. You should jump on top of your friend's shoulders and let him walk you for garmidi, uh, which is a, a certain uh, distance. The reason for this is that the idea is that probably the snake is following your footsteps. It's following the trail of your walking. And therefore, if you ride on your friend's shoulders a little bit, there will be a, an interruption of your footsteps. He'll lose your trail and he won't be able to track you down. And if not, so he says, Lisha'er, uh, uh, Nagra. He should jump over a pool of water, so that way the snake cannot easily follow him. Bi'ila, and if not, le'avar nahara. He should pass over a river, so that the snake can follow him. Ovalelia, and at night, lotvele puriyar ba'a chavita. This snake is obviously really has it out for you. So even at night, you have to put your bed onto four barrels. Venigne be kochave, and you should sleep under the stars. Don't sleep in your house because if you sleep in your house, maybe the snake is going to climb onto the roof and drop down onto you. You don't want that, and you don't want it to climb up on you. So you put your bed onto these four barrel. So you're really taking a lot of precautions here. Um, you should take four uh, cats and you should tie them to the four legs of the bed and then you should take some sticks and branches and stuff like that and you should put them around your bed so that when the snake comes and rattles them the, the, your cats will come and eat the snake. So you've got a security system up the kazoo here. You have, you know, from above, there's nothing he can jump on you. He can't come from below. you got the security system. you got the cats there. What snake are you talking about? Yeah, this, this snake is, has a serious issue with you. I don't know what you did what to the snake. What animals that attack the snakes? Yeah. Like cats, they're... Yeah. Um, that attack snakes? I don't know. A lot of animals, actually. Not, all, I know is, all I know is that whatever you did to the snake... It must have been pretty serious. But there are okay. also there snakes are so many cats that would go the And, and yeah. there are also a know. lot of snakes that will swim a lot right. better yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Or, uh, yeah, well, I don't think it's talking about that kind of thing. Hi, man, Rahita Batre. So let's say your a snake is following you. So uh, it says lirhit bechalta, go into the sand because it's much harder for them to travel on the sand. Hi itita, a woman the chaziach hivya that a snake was looking at this woman velo yada yaib date ilava ila, and she doesn't know if this snake has gotten interest in her. In other words, it's romantically interested in her or not. So yaib date ilava. I'm sorry, ila yaib date ala ilava ila yaib date ilava. She doesn't know what what his intentions are. So tishlach mana unishadia kamish. She should throw her clothes, take off her clothes and throw them in front of her in front of him if he starts going into her clothes that means he's in love with her the snake and if not if he doesn't go for her clothing then that means he doesn't like her uh, what should she do so the first suggestion is she should have relations with her husband in front of the snake and then when the snake sees that he'll run away alternatively this is actually going to entice the snake even more rather she should take some of her hair and her fingernails and throw them at him. And say, I am a menstruant. So Rashi says, this is lachash ba'alma. This is just, the, the snake doesn't really understand what that means, but it's some kind of a, an incantation that they would say to ward the snakes off. A snake, that a snake actually, a woman that a snake actually went into her. So what should she do? Lift se'ah. And they should take, they should move her, 
should have her sit on two barrels so that her womb is open because it went up into her body. They should take fatty meat and start cooking it over the coals. And they should take a, um, a, a, a container of cress and some, some uh, good smelling wine and they should put it there and they should mix the wine with the vegetables and she should take um, tongues in her hands because when he smells the smell of the, the cress and the wine and the cooking meat nafik is going to come out uh, nafik v'ate. so he's going to come out so nafik v'ate. When, when he smells the smell he's going to come out and she can grab them with the tongues and she'll throw them into the fire because if she doesn't throw them into the fire he's going to come back to her even after he comes out because this guy is really this snake is really attached to her Okay, so these are interesting snake uh, deal, ways of dealing with snakes. This uh, we crocodile Dundee. We've come a long way. Um, now we're going to uh, move to a new subject. Called ochalin leitu. So what, it said in the Mishnah that any food you can eat, if it's a regular food, even if your intention in eating the food is medicinal, since it's not something which is only eaten for medicinal purposes, it's not viewed as a medicine. So what does it mean? Kol ochalin. Kol ochalin leitu yeh. What did you mean to include by saying all foods leitu yeh to hold the that means eating spleen for the benefit of the teeth. Because she need live and eating uh, what's this called vetch, I think, right? For the stomach. Now, what's the point? What's the point here? Because even though techol, even though um, a spleen is good for the teeth, it's bad for the stomach. And karshinin, this this kind of vegetable that's normally given to animals to eat, actually, is is for good for the stomach but bad for the teeth. So each of them are good for one thing but bad for another. So you might think to yourself, why would any but he consumed this unless they had a medical reason for doing so. Since it might be good for one thing, it's bad for another thing. So therefore, the Mishnah is coming to tell you that as long as it's something that, would be, that could possibly be eaten normally, even though your me- intention is medicinal, and even though it has some side effects, you might say, it has side effects, you're still allowed to eat it on Shabbat since it's something that's normally eaten. And then they said, what's an example? Kola mashkin. Why did it say all drinks? What's it coming to include? The yei made tzalafin, caper juice, bachometz, mixed with vinegar. In other words, even though that's something that maybe a person wouldn't typically choose as their beverage of choice, but the, and they take it for medicinal purposes, but essentially it's also something that could be drunk under certain circumstances, and therefore we, uh, we look at it as a legitimate... Uh, drink, and we don't look at it definitely as a medicine in that case, even though it's not necess- it's something that might have certain side effects or might create certain discomfort when you consume it, but still, since it's drunk by certain people, um, not necessarily as medicine. We don't define it absolutely as a medicine. So now, Amarle Ravina, Ravah Ravina said to Ravah, Ma'ul Ishtot Me Raglaim Bishabat. You told me that urine is a, has a lot of medicinal properties, like we learned yesterday. So can you drink that on Shabbat? Amarle Tanena Kola Mashkin Shoteh, Me Raglaim Lo Shatu Ena Sheik. He said that that's a perfect example of what you can't do. Because it said, kola mashkin, anything which is drunk normally, not for medicinal purposes, you can drink it for medicinal purposes on Shabbat, as long as it's not obvious that you're doing so for medicinal purposes. But urine, nobody would ever drink. It's not a mashke, it's not a drink that you happen to be drinking for medicinal purposes. You're only drinking it for medicinal purposes, and that's why it would not be allowed to be drunk on Shabbat, because it's very obviously being used for a medical reason. Chutz me made dekalim. We said except for the water of dekalim, the water of palm trees. We're going to see what this is in a second. So Tana, we learned in, a, in another brayta. Chutz me made dekarim, except for made dekarim. Instead of dekalim with a lamid, dekarim with a resh. What does dekarim mean? Cutting water, penetrating water. So we're going to see what that means. So what does it mean? So man detana made dekarim shehim dokarim et amara. Why is it called made dekarim? Water that penetrates because it penetrates, it punctures, so to speak, the gallbladder. In other words, it goes straight through your system. So man de amar made dekalim sheotin min shene dekale. That why is it called made dekalim water of palm trees? Because it comes from between two dekalim, from between two trees. My made dekalim. What is an example of made dekalim? Amar rabba bar berona. Rabba bar berona says tarte tila e ikabim arava. There are two trees. I guess these are palm trees that they have in the west in Israel. And v'nafka ina demayavi benayu. 
and water comes from between them. In other words, there's a stream. It's called Medikalim. It's called the water of palm trees because it's the stream that flows between two palm trees and it has special medicinal uh, properties. So what are they? Kasakama, the first cup that you drink from this water, Mirape. It will make your stool softer. Idach Mishal You drink another one, it's going to make it really soft. Idach the third time you drink a cup of this, the way it goes in is the way it comes out. Meaning it cleans out your system so much it comes out as water. So it's really a, a diuretic, basically, we would call it. Okay, so this is a diuretic water. And it's, it was a water that uh, flowed from a spring between two... Not diuretic, but, uh, um, what do you call it? Laxative, laxative was what I meant, yeah. It's a laxative, right? So the, uh, that was the word that I was looking for. So the... Um, so the uh, 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 so the point was that this was a, it was called made Dekalim because it came from a stream that flowed between two Dekalim, between two palm trees. Okay. So Amar Ula Ula says, Le didi shatei de bavlae. I drank the beer of the Babylonians, umale minayu, and it was even better than this water. But that's only if you haven't drunk it for the past 40 days. Take a break from drinking Babylonian beer for 40 days and come back to it. It'll have the same laxative properties as this special water we're talking about. Rav Yosef, Amar Rav Yosef says, Zetoma Mitzri. Zetoma Mitzri was a, this is the Meid de Karim that we talked about before, that penetrates right through your system and will help you clean out illness from your system. So what is it? It's called Zetoma Mitzri. And Tilta Sare, it's one third barley, but Tilta Kortame, and it's one third of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, uh, saffron, right? Vitilta Milcha, and it's one third salt. Sounds delicious. It, 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 you put one third salt in anything, yeah, yeah. it'll clean out your system no because kidding. you'll be barfing. Yeah. No. Rav Papa Amar Tilta Chite Vitilta Kortame Vitilta Milcha. According to Rav Papa, instead of using barley, use wheat. So it's a third wheat, a third saffron, and a third salt. Vesimanech. And how do you remember who said what? Sisane. Okay? Sisane is a mnemonic for that the person who said Sa'are, who said barley, is a person who has a Samech in their name, which is Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef said barley. So Sisane will remind you of that. And you should drink it between Pesach and Shavuot. Why should you drink it between Pesach and Shavuot? Because because if you have, if your stool is too soft, it will harden it. And if your stool is too hard, it will soften it. So whatever it does, it regulates you. Basically, it regulates your bowels drinking this. What is it? What? what, what that's your saffron this salt mix salt of saffron, salt, and uh, barley or wheat. So it's gluten with the other uh, side. So, okay, but kos ikarin, what's a kos ikarin? This mixture of herbs that we talked about in the Mishnah that a person can, is only allowed, is, is only, is not allowed to drink on Shabbat because it was done for medicinal purposes. It was drunk for medicinal purposes. So my kos ikarin, what is this thing? Amar B'yohan, Amar B'yohan, says, Leite mitzkal zuza koma. First you take a zuz weight of koma, which is the, uh, sa- uh, the sap of a tree. Koma Alexandria, from Alexandria. Okay, umatkal zuza gab yagila, and you take a zuz uh, uh, weight of this uh, alum. Okay, umatkal zuza korkema, and you take a zuz weight worth of saffron. Uh, oh, wait. Korkema rishka, right, which is a specific saffron that grows in the garden. Okay? Right. Vilishakinu ba'adehadade, and you grind them up together. So, what do you have here? You have three ingredients. You have uh, one zoo's worth of this uh, kind of sap from a tree from Alexandria. One third is this uh, alum, and one third is this garden-grown saffron. Okay, which is here called the kurkama rishka, and you mix them together. So. Let's say somebody is a zava. So what did you use this for? A woman who's a zava means that her menstrual period won't stop. Okay, so a zava is someone who, the flow keeps coming. So they would give her this mixture, and as long as they mixed it also with wine, lome akra, she wouldn't become infertile as a result. Otherwise, this was considered something that would stop you from getting pregnant. It would make you infertile. It would make you sterile. Okay? Li yarkona, if the problem is that you have jaundice, then what you need is teren b'shichra o me'akar. You need two of these three ingredients. You don't need all three of them. So I mean, you have the three ingredients of the tree sap, the alum, and the garden-grown saffron. So you have to have two of the three with beer. But the only problem is umeakar. But then you will become sterile as a result of drinking it. So it will have the positive effect that it will, uh, uh, you know, it will cure your jaundice, but it will leave you sterile. 
lazava for a zava tlata bechamra velo meakra. All three ingredients, you mix it with wine, and the zava will stop having her condition of excessive menstrual flow, and she won't become sterile. Ve'ila, and if that doesn't work, bring her three kafizim, which is, uh, a kafiz is a lug, okay? So that's, that's a log is, a, uh, is a, uh, a certain quantity. So you bring this quantity times three. Three of these three logs, so that's a total of nine log. Of shemeche parsae of Persian onions. You guys have that? Okay, do, I don't know if we have that. Soak them or boil them in wine. Then, uh, yeah, yeah. The Persian onions. Right. Venishakya, and then you make her drink it. So you you boil these onions in this wine, and then you make her drink it. Venemala, and you say to her, Kumizovech, get out of your state of ziva. Vila, and if that doesn't work, Lotva Parshad Rachim, put her at the crossroads in the street. Vilin Ketakasa de Hamra Biada, and have her have a cup of wine in her hand. Velete Inish Meachora, Veliv Ata. And somebody should come behind her and scare her. I thought that was how you cured hiccups, right? Velemala, <laughs> and you say, and you say to her, "Kum mizovech, get up out of your state of ziva." Veila, and if not, lete bona de chamuna, ubona de morika, ubona de shavlilta. You should take a handful of cumin and a handful of this time we use a different word but it's the same thing of saffron and a handful of fenugreek finish log bechamra and again you boil it in this wine v'nashakya and then you and again you uh, you make her drink it v'neimala and you say to her kum mizovech get up out of your state of ziva v'ila and if not leite shitin she'e didana take 60 seals of barrels v'leshafya and you put it on her body you smear it on her body v'neimala and you say to her kum mizovech Stop your flow. In other words, this is symbolic of stopping, obviously, because it's something that stops up a barrel. The line, if that doesn't work, you should take a certain type of a vegetable. A pashtina is a certain type of a grass or vegetable. And um, so you would take this and again you boil it in uh, the in wine. Uh, and again you rub it on her body. And you say to her, get out of your state of flow. If not, this is a type of a uh, bush that grows uh, on uh, in a, uh, it's a what it says is Rashi says it's a type of grass that grows among the uh, among the brambles and the uh, and and the bushes. So you take this and you and again you uh, and this time velikle this time instead of putting it on her body you burn it velisba v'shachake de kitna be bekaita or v'shachake de amar de amar gofna besidva. And if it's the summertime after you burn these ashes, you put them into a some kind of a silk rag, and if it's the uh, if it's the autumn or it's the winter time, then you take it and you put it into a cotton type of rag. These ashes, and apparently she would carry it with her, or hold it, and that would be the cure, uh, and it would cure her. Vilan, if that doesn't work, lechrisheva bere, you should dig seven pits. Vliklebehu shabishta yolda de arla. So you take. The um, you you take the uh, you dig the seven pits and then you take branch and then you burn shabishta yelda means a young branch the orla which is still within its first three years of life velin keta kasa de chamra biadan she should hold a cup of wine in her hand velokma meha velodva aha velokma meha velodva aha and you have her sit over each of these pits and inside each one of the pits is the ashes of this young branch and each time she gets up velkol chada vachada lemala and you say to her kum misovech get out of your state of flow veilan if that doesn't work like this semida. You should take some fine flour, um, and it says veliska mi palgalet atay, and you should rub it on her, the lower half of her body. Velemala and say to her kumi zovech, get out of your state of flow. Veilan. If that doesn't work, leita leite beata de neimata. Then you should take a the egg of an ostrich velikle, and you should burn it. Velisba b'shachake de kidna b'kayita b'shachake de amar gofna b'sidva. And again, you should take the ashes of this burnt egg, which is not kosher because it's from an ostrich. Yeah. And, non-kosher. Yeah, and you put it inside the uh, a cloth of silk if it is the summertime, and of cotton if it is the wintertime again. Uh, if that doesn't work, you should open a bottle of wine, not a bottle, a barrel of wine, just for her, and uh, meaning to say that she should drink a lot of wine. Just have her drink a lot of wine.
Okay, because the bottle is just for her, or the barrel is just for her. And if that doesn't work, go to the dung of a white mule and take a piece of uh, grain a piece of barley out of the dung of a white mule. If she holds it for one day, if she holds it for one day, her flow will stop for two days. If she holds it for two days, her flow will stop for three days. If she holds it for three days, her flow will stop permanently and she'll be cured. So these are all these various attempts, strategies to stop the woman from ziva. I think it might be worth, you know, just for a minute to understand the, the context of this. Uh, I mean, my take on it, and I, I might be wrong, you, you tell me if that's, if, if that's correct, but I think that they probably had access to certain spiritual forces that we no longer have access to, mm-hmm. and that's why that made complete sense to them, and for us, it's like, well, you know, what, the, you know, what, what is mm-hmm. this? So, well, there are two basic approaches in the Mepharshim here, and by the way, I, I translated Kitna as silk, he has it as linen, so uh, he has Pishtan. So Kitna is, uh, is Pishtan. And you'll see here in Amar Gofna, he says cotton. 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 Yeah. He even translates it. Yeah. So he doesn't say silk. He says linen. The, um, the, there are two basic approaches in the Rishonim. One approach is like the Sigula approach. So these are Sigulot that they knew they had some kind of a special understanding of medicine that we, is lost to us, either because we don't really know how to implement these anymore, or we don't really fully understand all the language sometimes is difficult for us to translate. In other words, um, words that, that, the there's some, that looks that it's completely physiological. There's right. no, spiritual no, no, I'm saying that there is some type of spiritual sigulot that they understood that we ah, don't okay. necessarily understand what they're talking right. about all the time. Um, that's one way of looking at it is it's some kind of a sigula healing. It's not, by, it's not physiological. Right. Um, that's some of the Rishonim take it that way. Uh, then you have people like the Rambam and the Rambam San uh, and, and many of the other uh, Rishonim, mostly the Sephardic ones, who say this was just their, you know, they didn't have very advanced medicine. And so a lot of their medicine was based on symbolic meanings because they didn't understand germs, they didn't understand the uh, all of that. Is, why would it work then? And not now. And not well, the problem, but look at the. They did, they but my, my response to that is look at how many strategies they, they had 15 different ways of curing it. Obviously, it didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, it often didn't work because they'd be, oh, if that doesn't work, try this. Oh, if that doesn't work, try this. We're not it's kind of like it's kind of like the doctors of today. They just throw a prescription at you, and that doesn't work. They just give you another one, and that doesn't work. Give you another one, and that doesn't work. Another one. Yeah. You went to a good doctor. You went to a good doctor. You don't yeah, have but that. I don't know. That's, that's, that's they, a hard thing to swallow. Because you know what they used to say when I was in graduate school, and they would talk about what treatments to give, in, you know, for psych- psychological treatments. They would say when when you tried everything, they would say that's called throwing the book at them. Just take everything in the book and give it to them. Right, right. Throw the book at them. Just, you know, anything, any treatment. So here you see that they weren't like foolproof, obviously, because they said if they, this doesn't work, try this. If this doesn't work, try this. Um, you know, I would say that I, I tend to think that it's, it's somewhere in between, that there's probably some even medical truth to some of these things. They might not have fully understood why. And then, and, you know, so sometimes it works. And sometimes maybe it doesn't. I mean, look at how homeopathic medicine has made a comeback. I mean, a lot of these discovering about, you know, that herbs have certain properties that maybe were underestimated for a long time because we went into, we went into the drug, you know, pharmaceutical business or whatever. Um, you know, they're rediscovering a lot of these things now. Look at Whole Foods. You know, they have all these, you know, homeopathic things. Do they really work? People will swear by them that they work. You know, I don't know. Well, the laxatives that they talk yeah. about, definitely. I'm sure that they were. That they were. Things like that. I mean. Yeah. Nowadays, mag citrate is a, is a salt. Uh, right. mag, that is mean, used as a. If you take Epsom salt with water, you're sure to clean up yeah. your system. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, so so let's let's go on a little further. We have a few more of these yeah. uh, important uh, <laughs> uh, descriptions of how they how they healed these how they healed um, these various conditions. So the yarkona. So we said before that teren b'shichra u'me'akar that. If you took two of the three ingredients of this mixture, and remember we had the three ingredients which were, the, uh, which were on the bottom of the previous amud, the three ingredients were taking this kind of uh, sap from a tree, taking this uh, alum, and taking this uh, saffron. Uh, from the garden and mixing it together. So if you just had two out of those three, you don't need all three, but you need two out of them mixed with beer, and it will make you sterile, but it will cure your jaundice. So, if that doesn't work, 
Then you should take the head of a fish called Shibuta, which is mentioned in the Talmud a few times, a salted fish, and boil it in beer and drink the beer. Ve'ilan, if that doesn't work, then you should bring the brine of grasshoppers, grasshoppers that were uh, probably pickled or whatever, they take the brine. Ve'ileka monina de kamtse, if you don't have that handy, then you should take the brine of certain kinds of uh, small fish and and go into the bathhouse and then you should put it on your body. So in other words, the combination of the steam of the bathhouse and putting this on your body would cause the jaundice to go out. If you don't have a bathhouse available, so go between the wall and the oven so that you get the heat and it will make you sweat. So a combination between applying this ointment, uh, either the brine of the grasshoppers or the brine of the fish, and uh, allowing yourself to sweat it out. Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, If a person wants to get nice and hot to sweat out the illness, he should uh, uh, wrap himself in his cloth. In other words, he should wrap himself in a blanket of some sort or in a, some kind of a, uh, uh, a cloak and that will cause him to become warm. He doesn't necessarily need to go to the bathhouse. So it says that either he can wrap himself in his own or it means somebody else sick who has the same illness and somehow that will heat him up, increase his temperature and help him to sweat it out. Rav Achabar Yosef Chashbei. Rav Achabar Yosef once had this illness and Avad Le Rav Kahana. Rav Kahana did this treatment for him of applying this ointment from the fish brine or whatever it was. It healed him. V'ilan, if you don't have this litet lata kafizet tamare, tamare parsiata, then what you should do is bring three kafizim. Remember, kafizim are three log. So three kafizim is nine log of, of the uh, Iranian dates, okay, the Persian dates. Utzlata kafize de kira and three kapizim worth of wax that drips from the honeycomb, which, which dripped over, wax that spilled over from the honeycomb, and three kapizim worth of red aloe, uh, right, and you should boil it again in beer, and drink it, and if not, and whenever it says if not, it either means it didn't work or you didn't have it, okay? So if it didn't work, Take the uh, a donkey foal and shave the middle of your head. In my case, I wouldn't have to do that. And you should take some blood from the forehead of the donkey foal and put it on your head. And make sure you don't blind yourself because if the blood goes in your eye, that would blind you or could. But putting it on your head should remove the jaundice. Vilan, if that doesn't work, let's Rasha, Rasha de Baracha, de Manachma You should take some pickled ram's head. Who doesn't have that in their kitchen? So take pickled ram's head, Vilishlog, Vishikra, boil it in beer, Vilishte, and drink it. Vilan, if not, let's say, Davar Acher, Hutarna. You should get a pig which is spotted or striped. And Vilikra, a Vilotve Ali Bey. And you should cut it open and you should put. It's innards, apparently, on your heart. Okay, put it on your body. Ve'ilan, if that doesn't work, leite karte mikavtuta de mishare. Then you should get some leek from the middle row of the garden. Make sure it's the middle row. Apparently, that was the sharpest, the strongest leek. How to... Uh, there was a certain Arab, uh, this is the old, you know, a certain Arab uh, uh, Bedouin or whoever, the Khashbe, who had this illness, he said to the gardener, Give me some leeks from the middle row, but here, take my garment as payment, because I didn't have anything else. Yahevle, he gave it to him, and then he ate it. But then Amarle, he said to him, Oshlan Gilimech, Vegnebe, can I please have my garment back? Can I borrow back my garment? Because remember, the treatment was you had to eat this and then you had to sweat. So I need my garment back so I can sweat and sleep in it. So he, he gave it to him and Kaleh, uh, he wrapped himself, Ikrach, and he, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, garment. And then Ganabe, he slept in it. And what happens? Kad uh, Echamem. So uh, what happened was he became warm and the gar- he became so warm that it fell off piece by piece from him. Okay, so he, he wrapped himself in it and went to bed. And in the course of the night, he became so hot that actually the uh, garment disintegrated. Yeah, it fell apart. 
So unfortunately, the payment that now I guess he owes this guy money because he gave him that as a payment, then he took it back to sleep in it, and when he went to sleep in it, it uh, disintegrated from the heat of the temperature. Now neither of them have clothing. Exactly. <laughs> now they're both in trouble. So, Yarkona, we said that if you have jaundice, so what do you do? So then we said, Churen Bishikra. You mix two of these uh, uh, ingredients of the three, two out of the three ingredients in beer, you boil the beer, and you drink it. But the only problem is it will make you sterile. So, how can you do it? How can you take it if it's going to make you sterile? You're not allowed to sterilize yourself. We learned, how do we know that you're not allowed to sterilize or castrate a person? Okay, tell me more because it says Ubarzachem lo tasu, bachem lo tasu. Because it says Ubarzachem in your land, you can't do it. Now, in the context, this is talking about castrating animals. It says you can't bring a castrated animal as a korban, um, so or any in any way if the genitalia are damaged or crushed or cut off, you can't use it as a korban. And the Torah is saying Ubarzachem lo tasu, bachem lo tasu. That not only can you not do it to animals, you can't do it to human beings. You can't castrate a human being. The this is what Rabbi Hanina says. So if that's true, uh, how can you drink this potion to cure your jaundice if you know it's going to castrate you, basically? It's going to sterilize you. How is it possible? So Because this is talking about a case where you didn't intend for that. In other words, when you purposely castrate yourself or sterilize yourself, you're not allowed. But here you're taking a medicine which really you want to cure jaundice and as a side effect, it's going to make you impotent or it's going to make you sterilized. That's a different story. And how do we know that that's a different story? Because Rabbi Yochanan says if you want your rooster to stop impregnating or stop fertilizing eggs, so therefore, what, so what can you do? If you cut off his red top, you know, the fancy uh, thing that makes him look beautiful, comb. he will, Mr. Ismail, what's it called? The comb. The comb. So then, so Mr. Ismail, he will become sterile of his own accord. In other words, what did you do? You didn't actually affect his genitalia. You didn't actually cut part of his body. You didn't give him a medicine to sterilize him. But by cutting that off, you cause him not to copulate or not to fertilize anymore. Okay. So Amar Ravashi, but Ravashi says, Ramut Ruchahu de Nakita Lei. But that, that's not true. That's not a good example. Why not? Because why does cutting off the comb of the Tarnagol of the rooster stop it from fertilizing eggs? Because you removed its pride. You made it depress the poor thing. You took away its sense of self-respect. That's why it doesn't do it. You didn't actually sterilize it. You just made it sad. And a sad, sad rooster is not going to do that. Okay, that, that's a different story. You can depress somebody if you want to. De- if you want to stop them from having children, make them really depressed. That's not sterilizing them. That's just making them. That's just you know influencing them not to uh, reproduce. That's d- totally different. But here you're actually taking a medicine that literally sterilizes you. How can you do that? So Ella basaris. Rather, we're talking about a saris. Somebody was already sterile or already castrated so Rashi says we're talking about a case of somebody who was already not able to have children and therefore by taking this jaundice medicine we don't care that it's going to, to sterilize him or that it has a sterilizing side effect because he's already sterile but wait a second Rabbi Chiyabar Abba Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Chiyabar Abba said that Rabbi Yochanan said Akol Modim as we t- turn to Kufiud Aleph Amur Aleph Akol Modim Bamechamez Achar Mechamez Shuchayav that everybody agrees that mechametz achar mechametz, somebody who creates leaven after leaven, is still liable. What is this talking about? That the offerings in the Beit HaMikdash always had to be not leaven. They had to be matzah. So what happens if somebody introduces a leavening agent or a leavening ingredient into one of the menachot, into one of the offerings of the Beit HaMikdash? It's, a, it's an isur deoraita. It's a violation of, the, of a mitzvah that he's not allowed to cause it to become chametz. So what happens if early in the process of preparation... So, so in other words, um, if a person uh, needs it with a leavening agent, that's avera number one. Now let's say the next guy comes and he shapes the dough in place with the leavening agent inside. And then the next guy bakes it with the leavening agent. So even though each person, he, in other words, by the time the second guy came around, the leavening agent was already in there. Right? It was already present. And yet still, we hold the second guy liable because he's still now participating in preparing this thing with leaven inside. 
So it's, uh, you know, so we don't care that it was already leavened. You're f- furthering it. You're perpetuating it. Okay? Now, w- the context of this was uh, talking about a, uh, a bechor, an animal, that had some kind of illness and required bloodletting. Now, the problem is you can't cut the bechor. You can't cut the firstborn animal and, uh, you know, in order to do bloodletting because you're putting a mum, you're putting a wound, a, a blemish into the bechor. So what happens if it already had a blemish? So anyway, you're not really accomplishing anything by putting a blemish in. That was the machloket. Can you, does it matter once it already has a blemish? So we said when it comes to mechametz, achar mechametz, where something is already chametz and you're not, you're not really doing anything more by making it more chametz, it's too late. And yet we consider it, uh, you know, we consider it still a violation. So, so too, even though the person is already sterile, giving him more sterilization drug uh, is, uh, is still an avera. Now, obviously, the, uh, the analogy is difficult to understand because once somebody is a saris, once somebody is sterile, they're sterile. That's it. Whereas when it comes to chametz, in other words, at each stage, you could say that there's more of a contribution to the, uh, to the process of leavening but by your involvement with the dough. Whereas here, it's either or. If the, if the person's sterile, they're sterile. So it's a little well, difficult to... You could take to, it as, also as the, if the person is sterile, maybe there's a chance that maybe a miracle would right. happen, but then, and then you, so you don't further the... Right, uh, right. So it says, but misares, achar misares, shu chayav. And we all agree. Chemically sterile and then surgically sterile. Right, so but misares, achar misares, shu chayav. And we similarly just like with the chametz in the Beit HaMikdash, that even though the, the leaven was already introduced, doing more, furthering the process, is still an avera. Similarly, that one who, who uh, castrates after castration is also chayav. How do we know that? Because it names all of these things. Crushed and cut and disconnected and so on. All of these different aspects of mutilation of genitalia. Okay, so im al karut chayav al nituk lo kol sheken. If cutting is already a violation, so obviously removing is a violation. If the cutting and it's just barely dangling is one violation, then why should cutting the rest of it be any different? It's already cut. So what did you really add? So the answer is el alavi no tek achar koret shochayav. The answer is that even if you cut it and therefore functionally it's not adding anything to remove it, it's still a violation to remove it. In other words, any contribution to the process of castration, even if the castration has effectively already been medically accomplished, is not allowed. Even though you might argue that you're not really adding anything, it's already been done. So, so too, even though somebody's sterile, by taking the medicine that's going to sterilize you, it's still prohibited. So, so therefore, what do we say then? Rather, we must be talking about an old person. The old person's not just sterile, but they're past the age where they're able to... Uh, let's say they're impotent, they're not able to, uh, uh, to, to reproduce anymore. But the Gemara says, Amr Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, Hene nechaziruni lena arotai. But Rabbi Yochanan said that even in his old age, by taking certain medicines that were prescribed, he had, I guess they had the old version of Viagra back then, <laughs> right? Whatever it was, he regained his youth. He was able to continue to have children. So, so age doesn't mean anything. Age doesn't mean anything. So therefore what? So Ella Isha, rather, this can be used for jaundice in a woman. This medicine, even though it sterilizes, it can be used for jaundice in a woman. So basically, according to halakha, only a man is obligated in peru urvu, in the mitzvah of uh, reproduction and being fruitful and multiplying. So therefore, for him to be sterilized is certainly prohibited. But for the woman... She's not obligated in the mitzvah of peru urvu. So for her to take a medicine that sterilizes her is not uh, going to uh, constitute the same violation. Now there are some that say it's still biblically prohibited to do it to physically uh, prevent a woman, you know, to physically uh, sterilize a woman. There are some who say it's rabbinically prohibited. But by taking this medicine that has a side effect of preventing her from being able to get pregnant, that, that would be permitted because she's not obligated to, uh, she's not obligated to reproduce. So then the Gemara asks, but what about Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka? Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka said that both men and women are obligated in, in reproduction. They're both obligated. So what's he going to say? He's going to say either with a woman who is old or a woman who is akara, is barren. In other words, with a man, we have a hope that even if he's older, he could still reproduce. At any age, really, you could still have children. 
Okay, it might be harder, it might be more difficult at certain ages where you might have issues that you need uh, some medical help, but it's always, uh, uh, you know, it's possible to deal with it. There's always some hope. Whereas with the woman, when she gets past a certain age or if she's barren past a certain point, we assume that there isn't any more chance without a miracle that she's going to be able to reproduce. So even according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Baruchah, who says that a woman is also obligated to reproduce, even he will agree that a woman who's past the age where reproduction is possible or who has a condition that clearly is not capable of uh, give, having children, that she would be allowed to take this medicine, even though one of the side effects is sterilization. But a man, even if he is, as far as we know, sterile, would not be allowed to take this medication, because there's al- and even if he's older, there's always hope, and even if he's sterile, adding sterilization onto sterilization is still prohibited for a man. So that's the conclusion of the Gemara.